Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives where you can listen to every episode we've ever done going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is September 28th, 2012, and my guest is economist and author Arnold Kling. Arnold, welcome back to Econ Talk. Thanks, Russ. Our topic today is education, and in particular online education, a field that is just starting to take off. We're going to talk about what it is, what its impact might be on traditional methods of teaching folks. And as a jumping off point, we're going to use a recent essay that you wrote for The American, and we'll put a link up to that article. And if we run out of things to say about education, which I think is unlikely, we'll I may pick your brain on other topics of the day, but uh, our plan is to talk about education. You start off with a very uh, thoughtful observation about the stagnant nature of educational technology. What, what was your point there? Well, that if you ask a – if you took a farmer out of the 18th century and put him on a farm today, they would not be able to function. If you took a, man, a factory worker out of the 18th century and put him in a factory today, uh, they wouldn't be able to function. But if you took a professor out of the 18th century and put him in a classroom, they might be a little surprised to see a whiteboard instead of a, a black chalkboard, but they would be able to function pretty much just fine. Of course, their knowledge might not be up to date. It depends on the field, though. If they're yeah. teaching Shakespeare, they be, should be just great. Yeah. <laughs> it's a shame those lectures are lost, actually, in the past. Um, now, that was until recently, at least, that education hasn't changed much. Um, we did have the opaque projector. I mean, that was a breakthrough. Yeah. But but you're right. The, the technology is you stand in front of a room and you tell folks uh, some things or you talk at them or listen to them answer some questions and um, there's a text sometimes that you help that helps you organize it but that hasn't changed very much until recently so what you do in this article is you take a number of the recent innovations in that use technology and you talk about whether you think they're uh, winners losers or uh, a magic bullet and by magic bullet I assume you mean really great yeah yeah so uh, so Winners, losers, and really big winners potentially in terms of their effect on on education. So the first one you look at is uh, what's sometimes called massive open online courses. So this would be uh, Khan Academy, Udacity. Uh, there's a number of other Coursera, Coursera, Udemy. We'll put links up to all these, of course. And the idea here is that anyone anywhere in the world, and often at any time, not just at when the course is being taught, can can get online and uh, access the material and and learn. And to my surprise, I'm a big fan of this and we'll, we'll I may defend it, but you call it a loser. Yeah, I think it's overhyped at the very least. That um, I I don't think it's a killer application to or a magic bullet to take a a uh, course that you maybe you lecture to a hundred people and blow it out to a hundred thousand people. I think that's kind of the wrong direction. Trying to make a what's a very relatively ineffective education process and sort of make it bigger. Um, I think education works is more has to be more customized, has to be more toward the individual. And my impression about of what happens with these massive online courses is that. Uh, you get two extremes that benefit the people who are extremely close. Let's say, let's say it's a use a Stanford uh, on, you know, massive online course an example. So the students on campus actually benefit because the course was sort of geared to them to begin with, and then all they have to do, and, and they they have the option then of attending or not attending class, and they often find that not attending is is just works just fine. And they watch the. Material being covered on, on yeah. the web, and if they <laughs> need to, cons- you know, as opposed to skipping it, which also happens in universities. That's another way. Yeah. You say they, they they don't show up, and that's fine. Yeah. You're talking about they don't show up, and they watch the material online, right? And then, uh, and then when they encounter, um, you know, quizzes or projects, if they want to ask somebody down the hall, you know, for help, that that person down the hall is available just as they would be if they were taking the course in the class. So. 
Um, it's not that different an experience. I mean, I, I, I tend to assume that, that the lecture is one of the least important components of education. And so if that gets moved to an, a different environment, uh, it, it doesn't make you know, that big a difference. So that group of students, the Stanford students who have colleagues who can help them and who, uh, for whom the course is geared, they, they do fine. Another group that benefits is c- the group that's farthest away from Stanford, people in, uh, let's say, the former Soviet Union or in Africa who happen to have the ability and enough background to handle the course but who never would have the money or the ability to come to Stanford and take it. And that's very few people because uh, there are not very many people in those places that that uh, that have that ability. But that th- but they benefit. So you have uh, those two extreme groups, and in the middle you have tens of thousands of people who don't benefit at all. And my my guess is that the dropout rate from these courses is probably ninety ninety five percent. So that you get a, a hu- <coughs> the hu- huge proportion that have no benefit at all from this. Well, I, I think that's overly pessimistic, and let me let me push back, and, and you can respond. So, uh, Sebastian Thrun was um, taught a course in artificial intelligence, I think, at Stanford, as the first example of this that that you're using as an example, where I think something like a hundred and something thousand people took it around the world, a few hundred took it at Stanford Live, and as you say, a bunch of those decided to watch a ch- good chunk of it online rather than physically come to class when the class was scheduled. My memory is is actually a substantial number did finish the class. Uh, we can debate about what that means, but I think it was something like 20,000 did all the homeworks. And so the dropout rate, not 95, more like maybe, oh, uh, whatever it is, 70, 60, mm-hmm. something like that, um, 75, but still a maybe 80, but still a pretty good attendance. Um, a lot of people had an incredible experience that couldn't have done it before. You, we can ask why they dropped out. It could be it wasn't meant for them. It could be that the material wasn't presented in a way that was tailored for them, as you're suggesting, which I think is, is definitely part of it. Uh, but I think what where the potential for this technique lies is in different kinds of material. I think it, I think the, the potential is different for different kinds of material. For example, in one of their courses, one of this this is Udacity now. Uh, Udacity offers a class on how to program in Python. It, that's something that you can learn, get better at. You could master it. You can't master Keats, um, Shakespeare, probably not even microeconomics by following a set of prescribed steps and being quizzed and responding. It's a lot harder different set of ideas. But for things that where there's potential for, for technique and mastery, such as computer programming, possibly statistics, maybe some kinds of economics, don't you think the ability to give access to that material in a way that is visually interesting and that is uh, potentially more interactive than a traditional classroom with that, those 100 students, don't you think that has some real potential? I think it does. However, I, I don't think that, that- – Taking a traditional course and migrating it to the online environment is the best way to do it. The best way to learn computer programming is sort of on an as-needed basis. Um, you, you know, <laughs> I, I don't think a computer course, as traditionally structured, is really the best way to learn it. I, I mean, but th- there's it's certainly easy to learn programming online. I mean, I did some programming this summer and it was just a much different experience than it was 15 years ago. 15 years ago, you'd have two or three books spread out and you're like flipping pages through books. And now you just ask Professor Google and Professor Google links you to a a little short video that demonstrates exactly what you need. I mean, it's... it's, But... uh, But... It's Professor Google. It's not a structured course taught by one person. It's just little snippets from different people that you pick up in order to learn computer programming. It's, today. More, it's more crowdsourced, essentially. Yeah, and it. Yeah. Um, let me ask you one more question before we move on about this. Uh, something you just said about you said lectures aren't very important. 
Uh, I certainly agree with you that if your idea of teaching is to read out of the textbook or to reproduce what's in the textbook, that the textbook has already honed the best way to transfer the material. That would be true. I, but, of course, we know that's not true. Uh, and it really makes your point that if you think you're going to port your classroom lecture onto the web as a way of, of making your web-based class on the web, you're not going to gain much. And similarly, if you just read the textbook in front of your class, they're not going to get much either. Clearly, what happens in a great classroom is something intangible that's hard to describe where it's partly what we're doing right now. It's partly dialogue. It's partly a back and forth. It's question and answer. Um, but a great lecturer doesn't just – isn't just the equivalent of a good book on the topic. It, you get into that person's head and you, you get a whole new way of looking at the world. Perhaps, uh, or maybe you just get some a little bit of entertainment. Maybe you convinced yourself that you're you're learning something. It's really hard to say, but one of the things that you'll notice if you uh, play around in or you search around in some of these, uh, even some of the well-known massive online courses. Like I went to a a, um, a statistics course that I I don't know if it's part of Coursera or or one of these large popular consortiums. And it's taught by somebody at Princeton, and it's obvious that he just said, well, I can just film the lectures I've been giving all along. So the course begins with a 25-minute lecture on histograms. And I submit that there are very few people who will put up with a 25-minute lecture on histograms if they're not, you know, going to Princeton and... and uh, feel like they got to, yeah, they got like their money's worth. Go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's... You know, I, I, you just take one look at that and you go, I mean, it, it, I'm sure it's a great lecture on histograms and that his his idea of using that as a way to introduce statistics is valid, but that just will not cut it uh, long term. It, 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 the, my prediction is that that course will not survive as a popular course. And is he – was he being filmed standing in front of something or was it just his voice with histogram stuff? Um, no, well, there's a little bit of him. Uh, I, I'm trying to remember whether I – mean, I'm sure that the, you know, that they also show some drawing. But yeah, actually it's more of him than you would think is reasonable in my view. So I think the big breakthrough of, of Khan, the Khan Academy and Udacity and, and some of the other uh, ones I've seen – is that they realize that filming someone teaching is not uh, visually compelling unless that person's remarkably attractive, telegenic, um, and it's lit and produced in a very high end way. And that would be the equivalent of, say, a TED talk. Yeah. So a TED talk to me looks good. It's fun to watch. Whether you learn anything is a different issue, there's been a little bit of a backlash against TED. But I think if we're talking about academic disciplines. I think the great insight of, of, of the Khan approach or the Udacity approach is that you listen to the voice, you don't watch the professor, and the material that you see on the screen is what engages you visually, not the person's face and mouth, et cetera. Right. And but then you have then I think people have gone beyond that. First of all, they realize that actual writing is too slow. Yes. So the best produced videos speed up the writing process to get the writing going quickly and they they just they the visual images move move more quickly than you would if you were given if you had an actual professor writing the board and then the next step is to realize that um passively watching the video is not sufficient so uh, the best ones are now adding questions that happen during the video that the student is supposed to answer um and that's the good news is that's very engaging. The bad news is that you begin to see the challenges that, you know, a lot of students are just not going to be able to answer those questions, and the responses that they get back are going to frustrate them. They're not going to explain why they got it wrong. And that, um, and so what that, to me, gets back to is the notion of, you know, the goal really should be to personalize learning. It shouldn't be to blow out your lecture to 100,000 students, but ask yourself, what would I do if there were just one student in the room? And you wouldn't lecture to them. You would probably give them lots of things to think about, problems to work, and as they work the problems, you would coach them directly and say, well, no, think about it this way, or you know, uh, this, th here's what's wrong with your current way of thinking about it. 
What about Here's this? a hint. Yeah, here's a hint. But not here's, too big here, a hint. <laughs> here's another question to, that'll help, kind of help you, an intermediate question that'll maybe help you get there. So, uh, and so, there would be probably some emotional coaching as well. If the, if the person's just completely tuning out, you say, no, you can do this. Here, just just uh, take a moment and think about this. Uh, or you know, maybe you're, you're trying to go too quickly. Slow down. Um, so... I, again, I think that the best way to te- to think about teaching is to think about what would you do if you just had one student in the room rather than think about, wow, I could get 100,000 students to watch this lecture. Yeah, I, you and I have talked about these topics before, and I, that's one of, of the two deepest things uh, I've heard you say about this. I think it's an incredibly provocative and and important idea. And when I think about it, I think about how – I interact with my economic students. Traditionally, I teach a very Socratic class where I'm probing and pushing and asking who understands this and when they can't get it, if not enough hands go up. And obviously in that situation, you know, I give them a hint and not too much of a hint. And there's a big sweet spot there, just like in the quizzes you're talking about. If the quiz is too easy, people just start skipping it because it's it's a waste of time. If it's too hard, they skip it because it's a waste of time. You have to find, it's like a crossword puzzle. You've got to find the right level of difficulty so that people get the satisfaction of doing it well, but not too hard that they can't get through it and they get frustrated. But when I think about my children, the one-on-one model, when I teach my kids economics at the dinner table, uh, it's a it's something like what I do in class, but of course, ideally it's better because it's totally tailored to their level of they're close, but not quite, so I, I can give them the right kind of hint. Plus, I know them pretty well, so I know what kind of hint to give them so that they don't get frustrated, but they also can make progress. And you also would not give them a lecture. I mean, that's just... <laughs> yeah, sometimes I give them a lecture. <laughs> Ask them, they'll tell you. No, uh, you're right. I, I don't sit there and expound. Uh, but there's things that come up they're confused about. I might explain something, but in general... You're right. It's uh, what we enjoy talking about at the, at the dinner table are problems, yeah. uh, pro- things that, that are interesting to puzzle out and explore. And then that's where the learning takes place. I don't want to miss your second deep idea. I'm sure you have more than two, Arnold, but the two that I, that have, I think, caused me to think a lot about these issues is your insight about feedback. Yeah, my my line is that teaching equals feedback, that uh, it's really the back and forth between the student and the teacher that generates the learning. It's like, so the student is finding out, wh- you know, where they're wrong or where they need, where they're right, where they need to go next. Um, and, you know, the problem with just videos or textbooks is that it's very hard for the student to get that feedback. And I think everyone who's tried the Khan Academy flip the classroom model. Explain can, what that is. Okay, so that's a model where... Instead of lecturing in class and sending the student home to do problems, you send the student home to watch video lectures and then have the students come to class and work problems and then sort of walk around the classroom and help them work problems. And I've done that uh, in my high school teaching. Uh, I'm very happy with it uh, because it gives me the opportunity to be giving more feedback. As I'm walking around, I'm seeing where students are stuck, where they're, uh, where they're doing okay, uh, and they're constantly asking me for help and hints on problems. And I think, um, you know, I, I think that that's, that is the, the essence of teaching. That if, that if the student is just passively watching a video or passively listening to a lecture, um, they're not, they're not sort of coming up against the sandpaper of working problems of, uh, trying to see whether they've really grasped the material. So there, there, you create this sense of uncertainty as the, did the student really get something out of it? Uh, and does the, and does the teacher know whether the student got something out of it? Whereas when the students does something themselves, answers a question, then the teacher has an idea. A very common problem, and you'll see this in sort of books, advice for teachers and so on. A very pro- common problem is a teacher will give a lesson thinking that the objective is X and the student gets something completely different out of it. Uh, they get they either pay attention to an anecdote that isn't central or they actually 
you know, come away with the wrong point of view. And until there's some sort of feedback, uh, nobody knows that that kind of disconnect has happened. Yeah, I used to give a what I called a one-minute feedback form. This is for me to get feedback at the end of every class. Uh, it was just a few questions. Um, one of those questions was, what was the most important thing you learned today? And often it was not the most important thing I wanted them to learn. That's a big uh, wake-up call for a teacher, and uh, that's certainly true. The other thought I had thinking about what you just said is that it, there's a – I think what makes a person a successful learner, a successful student, is the ability to self-monitor. Uh, so when you, I tell my students, when you read a passage, uh, when you try to do a problem, do you say, "Oh yeah, I know how to do that. I'll just, yeah, I'll just, yeah, I'll just, I'll let me move on." When in fact you really don't, or you, I kind of, yeah, I kind of get it, uh, and that you really have to get to a point where you master an idea or a concept. And students, of course, can't do that at first. They don't know whether they've mastered it. And that's your, I think. One aspect of your point is that you have to give them a way both to know whether they master it and then to, to assess themselves. And that's really what uh, I think grown-up learning uh, is about. I don't mean just as an adult. I mean at uh, any point in our life is when you realize, I know this now. I really understand this. And that is a real art. And it's something I think as teachers we often fail to teach them how to do that. And to the extent we do teach that and to the extent that students – can learn how to do that, they become better learners. Yeah, but it's it's hard work to teach that way. If you really yeah. want to teach that way, <laughs> what you do is you say every time you assign something, you ask the student to write something about it, and then you comment on what they wrote and say, well, you know, this missed the point, this was on the point, this was interesting, I hadn't thought of it before. Um, but that constant feedback is what you would need to do. Yeah, standard technique of learning is to teach people what you've learned to see if you really do learn it. And that's one reason teachers learn a lot when they teach, because you think you understand something. Until you've taught it, you often realize, when you teach it, you realize you didn't understand as well as you thought you did. But uh, I always tell my students, when you understand something, tell someone else. See if you can explain it to somebody else. That is a measure of, of, of self-assessment. Yeah. And, that, and that, you know, that's a good teaching practice. You know, put something in your own words. That's con- something that, you know, good teachers are constantly asking students to do. But again, that's hard work. It's a lot harder work than sort of tossing off a lecture and saying, you know, I assume people know know what I'm talking about. Or giving them some multiple choice questions to see if they yeah. can understand what the key points were, which is not the same as using the material. I mean, my mm-hmm. main complaint about most textbooks uh, isn't the passive aspect of it. It's, the, it's related to that, but it's really the idea that, that economics, say, is a, a set of facts, you know, the ratio of the prices equals the marginal rate of substitution and right. you know, maximizations in an optimal situation. And that's a um, – that's good for spit back, but it doesn't teach you to think like an economist. And there is no really good textbook on how to do that. And there's no online uh, aspect of that. And I like to think part of what we're doing here in Econ Talk is is a little of that. But even here, we're doing a bunch of other things at the same time. And I think there is an opportunity – someone could figure out how to do that on the web uh, to make it make a real impact. Yeah, well, that is certainly a challenge because it's you know, the it, the easiest form of feedback to automate is you know the multiple choice type question. The hardest feedback to automate is the open ended question, the critical thinking question. And I think that you know I think we're so far. You know, the distance that we need to travel to do that is so far that uh, it'll be a long time before we're capable of doing that. Right, and the example you gave, uh, and I, I used to tell my students this all the time, which would be, if you think you understand it, write it up. Put it in your own words. Like when they'd say, how do I study for your exam? I'd say, well, why don't you go home and try to write up some of the ideas we've talked about in your own words. That, that'll You'll find out whether you understand it. You'll get better at, at thinking about it as you write it up. But ideally, you'd do that every night and you'd grade it. Uh, you'd give personal feedback on how the quality of their write-ups. Um, and I, some people do that. You could have a blog that you grade of students where they have to write those things up. But I think that's a, a superb teaching method that's incredibly time-intensive. Uh, right, and it, and we don't know how to automate it. Right. We, we, you do need right. a teacher to do that. Yeah. Um, let's talk about some of the other innovations that, that you discuss in your article. Um, you're a big fan, I think, for reasons you've made clear in this last few minutes, of, of adaptive textbooks. What is an adaptive textbook and uh, why are you... Well, why are you <clears throat> okay, so 
uh, it's it's it may be more of a dream than reality, but it would be a textbook that responds to students' questions, that gives students questions and adapts to their level of ability. So if as a student shows that they have mastered some material, it, it will give them harder questions. If a student is struggling, it'll keep repeating material until they learn it. Uh, the other, you know, sort of fantasy for an adaptive textbook would be one that uh, sort of got a sense of the student's mood. So if it sees the student is just rushing too quickly, it does does something to soothe them, to slow them down. If the student's angry, it try, tries to soothe them. If the student's impatient, it tries to uh, deal with that. Uh, if the student uh, you know, sort of loses confidence, somehow uh, an adaptive textbook would, would kind of encourage them to move on. Um, so that would be sort of the, the the fantasy version. The closest thing to reality might be uh, there's there's a, a biology textbook that was announced a couple months ago, or an online, or actually I guess it's a an iPad version, an, an app that's called Project Inquire, where they used a knowledge map to make it possible for a student to ask a question and get uh, in their the student asks the question in the student's own words and then get answers back from the textbook. So if the student just has enough curiosity and a little bit, just enough curiosity to ask the right questions, they can kind of work their way through the through the knowledge base by asking questions and getting answers. And the, uh, they claim <laughs> that they've tried that and shown that it works. Yeah, they claim it. I don't know. I mean, I think that I, there is an enormous, uh, as you say, a gap here between the, the ideal and the reality of, of the application of artificial intelligence to this whole process. Your description of the adaptive textbook is really just a personal tutor who's, it's Mr. Google as personal tutor, right? It's yeah. the ability to access the knowledge of the web. I'm putting knowledge in quotes there. I mean, yeah. it's kind of an absurd idea. The question is, what would the reality, how close can we get to that? Maybe not today, but soon, yeah. that would allow a person to explore those kind of, at that level and get that kind of feedback. I don't know if that's ever going to be possible. It's kind of a, I don't know. Yeah, well, one scenario is that the world just belongs to self-learners. Uh, I've sometimes heard Tyler Cowen make this claim that if you have somebody who has the sort of self-motivation and the kind of know-how to sift through what's available online, they will have tremendous advantages, and everybody who's dependent on a teacher of any sort will be at a disadvantage. That, uh, that That's one one scenario that you can lay out. I don't know. Hard to know. When I think back on my own formal education, and um, I, I taught myself a ton. It's a huge part of, of, of learning. And I learned a lot from my classmates. That was a huge part of my graduate school yeah. learning, for example. Uh, but there were teachers who, I mean, they obviously taught me more than the material, right? They taught me things about integrity, passion, um, curiosity that that inspired me right yeah. also just watching someone's thought process yeah. and saying seeing how they ba- tried to uh in economics i think the most interesting teachers are the ones who try to see multiple points of view and and see uh and see things from different points of view rather than present a single point of view i remember being in robert lucas's class when he was working on business cycle models uh this is 19 19- 1976, 77, somewhere around there. And he hadn't gotten very far yet. And But we got to see him trying to figure it out. It was exhilarating, very frustrating as a student at times. But the ma- the main thing I got out of that class wasn't an understanding of business cycles. It was a respect for a, a great scholar who was trying to struggle with the reality. It was phenomenal. Um, I, I think there are a lot of... You know, again, I I think most of great teaching is a mix of that inspiration and also some, you know, window opening, door opening, uh, or maybe even better word is window washing. You know, there's something that's opaque to you and that teacher makes it clear in a way that you can't do on your own. You can't, uh, you can't learn it yourself. It's a lot harder. I, I remember taking a class on Faulkner in college. I didn't have much respect for Faulkner at the time. I was 19 years old and and snotty. 
and the class was on Faulkner and Conrad, and I loved Conrad. By the end of the class, I thought Faulkner was the greatest writer of all time, and I thought Conrad was, eh. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't think I could have done that on my own um, without, uh, without Dr. Patterson. I think that was his name. Anyway, I thank him for that. Uh, I want to talk about another, some of these other examples. Uh, we talked about the flipped classroom. What's independent certification and why do you think that's important? Well, one of the phenomena that's important in education in the United States today is that uh, if you go back to the end of World War II, I think something like fewer than 5% of jobs required a formal education to get a license. Now it's something like uh, I've read about a third of jobs require that. So we've really become... Because we have too many lawyers. Yeah, well, there's... <laughs> They're swelling the, the numerator there. <laughs> yeah, well, th- th- there's a lot of, um, you know, there's clearly a lot of rent-seeking going on in the in the creation of these requirements. And, uh, you know, people have mocked them. Uh, there's, you know, people have mocked the requirement that uh, uh, you actually, in some states, t- need a license to give somebody a manicure. I mean, that's, you know, the, the extreme. Um, but... Uh, so what that says is that a lot of the value of education is just the credential, just the certification that you learned it. So, you know, let's say some, you know, let's say you had a self-learner now who could teach, who could go, you know, sift through the web and actually learn uh, as much as a Harvard student about, you know, English and economics and physics and whatever. How could that student demonstrate that they've uh, achieve that level of knowledge. And so, um, and another way to put this is how, if you're really going to scale up college education, and we can talk about whether that would be a good thing or not, but if you're going to sort of, you say, wow, my goal is to have everyone go to college. If you're going to do that, then you can't have this tight credentials cartel that only certain places are able to certify that someone has a college degree. You're going to have to come up with you know, alternative certifications. So if we're going to you know, broaden access to college education, we're, a necessary condition will be sort of some alternative way of certifying. I think an additional benefit is I think there's actually a, um, an agency problem in having the same professor teach the course and grade the course. A conflict of interest. Yeah, that you can... Um, and, and, you know, it shows up in lots of ways. It, you know, generally shows up in grade inflation. Uh, my guess is that a lot of teacher evaluations, the rate my professor type stuff, really boils down to how generously they grade. I think it... There's a well-known correlation between easy grading and positive evaluation. And that, you know, that creates a real... Uh, problem in education, but if you separated out the grading from the teaching, that would completely reverse itself. The more rigorous teachers who were maybe tougher on you during class, but who helped you earn a higher grade from an independent certifier, they would suddenly be popular instead of being unpopular. Um, so, I th- and so I think there's just a lot to be said for separating the functions of teaching and certifying. And I think I suspect the main reason that that's not done is because the control over the certification is considered by most colleges and universities to be their main source of value for them, and that they're very threatened by the notion of an independent certification. But we'll come back to the issue of whether education is actually valuable or whether it's just the credential. We're going to come back to that, but I think how could... How could we do an independent certification? How might that work? Um, well, there, you know, we have examples of it now. Um, things like the advanced placement tests in, you know, for high school courses are a good example of that. Where, um, you know, that it tells you independently whether they've learned it. Now, the complaint about something like that is it's teaching to the test and. You know, suppose I'm a, a creative teacher and I'd like to teach something else. But I saw, you know, when I was an undergraduate, I went to Swarthmore College, and they have this uh, program that about half the students are in called the Honors Seminar Program, where the curriculum is made up entirely by a Swarthmore professor 
but the exam is given entirely by an outside examiner, typically a professor from another school. So the Swarthmore professor will send the syllabus to the outside examiner. The outside examiner will create an exam and then will grade the exam. Uh, it's, uh, um, you know, it's really taking a risk from the Swarthmore professor's point of view. That, Oy, yeah. <laughs> that's a frightening, uh, frightening um, thought. Yeah. And, uh, but it's, uh, but it, it's really making a statement that, that we can teach. And that you can you can go ahead and test us on what we say the syllabus is. Um, and I think that's very powerful. I, I don't know whether that kind of external evaluation can be done cost effectively at uh, for many institutions. But if, but if you can come up with a way to do that, I think that would be a a very powerful tool. I think it also just thinking about it forces you to confront the fact that there's a very um idiosyncratic aspect to almost to so many classes, right? Um, Mm -hmm. What I expect my students to learn is not what you expect your students to learn. And my students wouldn't do very well on your test and your students might not do well on my test, which means either one of us is a very bad teacher or we're both teaching two things that are really different or neither of us is doing a good job. I'm not sure. Well, or that you need to really be clear about what your objectives are so that another person actually could write a test, even though they, they might teach want to teach the course differently, they understand your objectives clearly enough so that they can write a test that's appropriate for yours. Yeah. So my my line is for an independent certifier, instead of uh, making somebody teach to the test, we have to be able to test to what you teach. Yeah, it's an interesting idea. Uh one last example, and then I want to move on to some other general issues. Uh, you're, you're negative about clickers in class <laughs> feedback devices, which would seem to be a good thing. In your feedback, it tells the teacher who's learning. Explain what they are first. Okay. And, and- um, okay. I'll have to say I haven't used them. I know some people are using them. I'll be curious to see how that, how they, they like them. But, uh, I gather it's a device where a teacher can, let's say, ask a question, maybe even a multiple choice question and have the students answer it. And so you get an immediate idea while you're talking of what proportion of students are getting a particular problem. That's, uh, there, there are other uses for these things, but let's, let's go with that one. Um, there are other things, there are smart boards, there's all these things. My, my, my concern with all these tools is that they're designed to reinforce a one-to-many type of teaching. And what I want, to, again, to think about what would you do if you had one student in the classroom? And if I had one student in the classroom, I wouldn't have them a, cl- give them a clicker. I'd just be talking to them back and forth. Uh, and so that, that's why I, I'm, uh, I, I didn't give that one a good vote. Yeah, I think uh, I think I've referenced this story before. Uh, maybe you'll help me. Maybe you know the story. I think the story is that Pagu was a student of Marshall. I think the timing for that is is correct, right? Marshall's right, older yeah, than yeah. Pagu. And my memory is is that I'll try to find a reference. This he was the only student in the class, but that didn't stop Marshall from coming in, standing at the front of the class with at the lectern with his notes and lecturing. <laughs> um, but he had a different uh, well, I model. I guess Pergu survived that. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, who knows what he could have been if he'd had a different yeah. uh, interaction with, with Marshall. Uh, uh, before we move on, I want to give give you one example of the clicker application that I thought was very provocative. I've used it a little bit in class. Uh, it was a physics professor who would give a multiple choice question, like you said, uh, and ask the students to click and vote what they thought the right answer was. And if most of the people knew the right answer, if most people got the wrong answer, he would – Either If it was the right answer, they'd move on. If it was the wrong answer, he'd lecture some more and explain some more stuff. But if they were pretty evenly divided, he would then have the class break into groups. He'd say, find someone next to you with a different answer from yours and see if you can convince them that you're right and they're wrong. And uh, then he'd re-vote. And this gets at the idea I mentioned earlier that when you can teach it yourself, you learn something. So this takes this classroom setting and makes it much more interactive. And and then they re-vote. And he found that they actually – of course, sometimes someone with the wrong answer convinces other people yeah. that, that they're right. But most of the time, the students who can't defend the answer because it's wrong learn that they've got the wrong answer. So to me, that's an incredibly valuable idea. You've you've got the students into teaching, not just listening. You've You've got them to engage with the material in a different way. You've got them reinforcing the learning. And when I tried that in my classrooms, I was shocked – at how 
the room exploded into conversation. I was afraid they'd sit there and they'd kind of, but immediately they jumped into into action. So it's an interesting technique. Yeah, and that gets into another topic, which is social learning. That is, that you know, students learning from one another, and that's um, that. That's one of the highly touted uh, and very hyped. In an, you know, there are a lot of online companies that uh, you know, startups and venture funded firms that say, you know, we facilitate social learning, and I'm skeptical about that because I'm first of all, I'm not sure that we know what works, what f- fosters social learning in a live classroom, much less how to reproduce that in, a, um, in an online world. Now, you gave an example that sounds like a great example of, uh, of social learning, but uh, you know, I've seen things in real life where, it, where the student interrelationships are dysfunctional. They discourage each other. <laughs> They, uh, sure. you know, the morale of the class is actually lower than the morale of, of some that that you could, you think you could get if you talk to them individually. Um, so it's a um, I don't think we I don't think we can we know what the the magic is, is in social learning. I, I don't think we're ready to bottle it and say, well, we can we can make that work online. Let's move on to some general questions about education that. That these uh, that these issues uh, inevitably uh, trigger trigger you thinking about the current state of of high school and college. Just as the technology hasn't changed much uh, in the last 150 years, they haven't changed much either. Either well, the dorms have gotten a lot nicer, and the food's better, probably uh, not probably certainly, uh, and a lot more people are going. Uh, do you think? Uh, that lack of dynamism is a government problem, a lack of competition. Uh, government's very involved in high school education. It's sort of very involved in college education, but there's a lot of private universities. They're obviously affected by the public universities' competition. What are your thoughts on that? Well, there's one line of thinking. they look different? Yeah. Well, there's one line of thinking that's very popular in uh, among academic economists, which is that to say that, you know, Let's look at cross-country comparisons. America has great colleges and universities, and we're mediocre to maybe even worse than that in terms of K through 12. So we're most we've got probably the highest proportion of public education in K through 12 of any country, and maybe the highest proportion of private universities and colleges of any country. So that's so that look at that correlation that we're we're great when we have got a lot of private competition and we're not so great when we uh have K through 12. And so that you know as an economist that makes you feel good like you're saying oh competition makes a difference so that you know makes us better at college it universities it makes some difference. As an academic that makes you feel good because you know you're at a college and university and you say we're great and the you know but it's the people who are in high school you know K through 12 are bad. Um I'm skeptical just because, in general, uh, the ability of different the ability of different educational methods to make a difference uh, is not well demonstrated. Yeah. Um, so you, you 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 typically you you only find anecdotal evidence, and statistical evidence tends to cut the other way. There's the Famous study, I guess it's Kruger and somebody else of comparing students who were admitted to Ivy League schools and to uh, uh, state schools. You can think of three groups of, of students: students who get admitted to Ivy League and go, students who only get admitted to uh, state schools uh, and therefore have to go there, and then students who are given the choice. Who can go either way, and the, and that third group of students who have the choice can go either way, um, and then let's say choose to go to the the state school. What do they look like? Do they look like the students who uh, go to the Ivy League schools, or they look like the students who had no choice but go to the state schools? And it turns out that they look like the students who go to the Ivy League schools, which makes you suspicious that um, you know what's going on. Is that colleges and universities are being are selecting the better students? So, yeah, it's easy to say that. So that another way of putting this is that 
if you believe that there's some educational method that's superior to another method, I dare you to do the following, which is swap the a set of students uh, who are learning, who are subject to one method for the method that you think is better. So if you think a suburban high school is really a better school than an inner city high school, I dare you to swap the students in those schools and uh, show me that you you still observe the the same dire- yeah, the direction of uh, relative results that you had before. Yeah, it's, obviously there's some what we call fixed effects, um, un, unmeasured variables that are explaining yeah. what's going on. And- yeah, and that raises a question of whether to think about education as a transforming system or a sorting system. So a metaphor for a transforming system is that the students come in as clay, you shape them as clay, and you turn them into, you know, pottery or whatever, you know, some, something, <laughs> yeah. something, something. Yeah. Some, 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 so yeah, but they're they're all but pottery they're all with the bigger head. Yeah, yeah, they're all the same raw material, but you can you know make something beautiful out of them. Uh, the sorting mechanism would be, uh, you know, if you go to a, a bank nowadays, you can take a jar of coins just that you've dumped into your jar, pour it into this machine, and it will sort out you know, which are the quarters, the dimes, and the nickels, and so on. But it hasn't changed the coins. They're still quarters, dimes, and nickels. It's just sorted them. And uh, I think you have to, when you look at education... When people talk about education, there's all this, they always have this idealistic view that they think of it using the clay model. But the reality is much more often the sorting model. It's very, it it is very rare to see provable, durable, scalable examples of actual transformation where you you can see uh, students being transformed. Uh, rather than just sorted. Yeah, I, I'm sympathetic to that view, uh, but I think it clearly misses part of what's going on in an edu- in, a, in, a, in some educational settings. Um, I think we armchair theorize. You think about your not theorize armchair. I don't know his <coughs> armchair history. Uh, you think back to your own education, which of course is a flawed exercise because you. Your memory is very selective, and it's you. So you know. Yeah. But again, I think you can look back and say, I, I can identify classes where nothing went in that lasted. Right? Um, you know, Robert Frank was on this program ages ago, and we talked about the fact that students who take a standardized test in economics eighteen months after the class is over don't do any better than people who've never taken economics. And I'm not sure it's quite that dramatic, but there's certainly some truth to that. There are classes that all you did was you absorbed some facts or some information, and then after a while it got replaced by other information and facts and didn't stay around, and it was just sorting. You got an A, <laughs> which put you into the quarter pile, and somebody else got a C, and that put him in the nickel pile, But and, and that, that's what happened. And that, that's what was the experience. At the same time, there are these, there are these teachers who and classes that that are – transformational, that change the way you look at the world, that give you insights into into things around you you couldn't have taught on your couldn't have learned on your own or didn't have had a chance to learn on your own. So it seems to me it's a mix. And I think the question to me is were those classes transformational because of the space I was in or I was ready to absorb those lessons? Or was it simply a great teacher? And if we just had enough great teachers, uh that could happen. Or is it the process? Is it we just need to create a classroom where I can teach myself and I don't need a great teacher? It's the, you know, it's the McDonald's model. You don't you have to be a great cook to run McDonald's. They've done all that for you and, and you get this standardized, pretty good meal. Um, is that what we should be striving for or should we be striving to attract these extraordinary transformational people who can, who can change people's lives? Well, I, you know, we don't know the answer to that. It would yeah. be, be great to be able to do – you know experiments. I know you've got uh, you've had Rick Hanushek who claims that uh, that teacher quality makes a difference. In particular, bad quality makes makes a big difference, and and maybe that's true. Um, there, I, I recently saw an article. I think it's by Martin West or something on um, sort of things that other countries do differently because other countries do seem to have better K through twelve outcomes. And you know, there again, that could be 
a sorting issue. It could be a a, uh, a teaching issue. But he, you know, the, he cited th- uh, three things. One is that they have more competition at the K through 12 level from private schools. That um, now, can I remember all three of them uh, on the spot? One of them was the um, <laughs> two would be good. <laughs> the, the second one, <laughs> I'll be like Rick Perry. <laughs> uh, um, a second is that they have high stakes testing, uh, not just a low bar. You you pass this test and you get to you graduate. Get to move on, yeah. Um, and uh, the third is that they draw teachers from a higher uh, level within their, you know, a higher academic level. Whereas we, we you know, we're not, we, you know, we get teachers from teachers' colleges, which uh, is often kind of the lowest of the college-educated group. So um, that's an interesting claim. Uh, I think it's uh, what I noted about it is that uh, those are all factors that uh, would be that any cha- where any change would be resisted by the current teachers unions uh but it it would be interesting to uh because it's often claimed that uh one of the things that happened in the United States as women uh grew access, got access to more occupations is that we used to have some of the brightest women uh in K through 12 teaching but we moved them out of that into uh, into other occupations, and so that might have uh, lowered the quality of our K through 12 education. It would be interesting to sort of see a controlled experiment world where uh, you know different, you know, higher level uh, of academic accomplishment people are put into te- teaching, and you compare a similar group of students being taught by lower level uh, accomplished people, and see, you know, do you do you have durable differences? But uh, you know, a lot of times when people say something works in education, the, the evidence is anecdotal. You can't prove that it was uh, transformation versus sorting. A lot of times the uh, difference disappears after a few years. Uh, so your example of the economics not making a difference after 18 months, there are lots of examples where cognitive ability you know, uh, is... Test stronger after one year, but after four years, that difference goes to zero. And a lot of these things don't replicate. So somebody will say, oh, the Perry School preschool project did this. But then you try something similar somewhere else and, and you see no impact. Uh, so you, it, it's uh, very hard to find. Uh, again, I dare, I dare somebody to find something that is, um, Durable can, based on controlled experiment, and can be widely replicated. It's very hard. Yeah, I agree. Um, it's um, again, you think about yourself. You know, we think you know what works for you, and what works for you in one setting doesn't always work in another. And what worked when you were younger doesn't work when you're older. I'm not sure that what you remember is the best measure of what you get out of a class, though. You know, I think a lot of times you learn something that you can't put your finger on. It's not a set of facts. It's a way, again, a way of thinking or but or it's just some inspiration. Tough, tough issues. Do you think um you think we have too many kids going to college in America or too few? Most people would say too few. Because well, you, everybody should go to college and it, and it, college <laughs> graduates make more money than non college grads. Okay, so there, yeah. The, so one way to do it, let's think of it in economic terms. Is there, you know, what's the what, what what does the supply and demand situation look like? And there's, you know, some data that suggests that there's uh, sort of an excess demand for college students, and that is, uh, first of all, the salary differentials on average are higher, and they're 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 high enough that they more than make up for the cost and even the opportunity cost of going to college. Foregone, so, the time you have to give up, yeah. whatever you could do. And the um, um, the other sta- other data are that um, uh, they're more likely to be employed. So that in addition to the salary differential, you have the higher probability of being employed. So you put those together, it's pretty seems like a pretty powerful case. The evidence that goes the other way, however, is uh, includes a couple things. One is that a large and increasing number of college graduates are now doing jobs that uh, you don't need a college 
graduate to do. So, you know, waiting tables or uh, answering phones and what have you. Uh, so if there's truly an excess demand for college students, society wouldn't waste those resources that way. They wouldn't, they wouldn't be, be putting college graduates into jobs that you don't need a college degree for if there's this, you know, if there's this unmet need for college graduates. So there's something a little wrong with that picture. Uh, and the other thing, the other alarming statistic is that if you get outside of the top 100 or so colleges, the completion rate falls to uh, 50% or less. And so that says that, if anything, we're sending too many students to college. Uh, I gave a talk recently at a community college where the professor said, you know, what exactly are we supposed to be doing with students who read at a fourth grade level? You know, am I supposed to be teaching an anthropology course to that student. Is, 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 what he's saying is that there, there is a need for you know, what you, you, call, you used to call basic adult education or remedial education. And if we're increasingly asking colleges or even community colleges to meet that need, what, you know, what's going on? What, so, um, so I think overall I would make the case that we're trying to send too many students to college uh, that there are too many who cannot read and write uh, at a college level, and we need to. If if we need more college graduates, the way to get them will either be to import them from other countries or uh, come up with some magic solution that uh, makes our makes people come out of twelfth grade more capable of operating at a college level. But you use an example of somebody who's you know, reading at a fourth grade level. You could also make the case that somebody who's very gifted isn't well served by college either. Um, there's a lot to be said for imagining that instead of hanging out with other 18-year-olds through 21-year-olds, uh, drinking and, and going to class a few hours a week, you ought to be doing something real maybe taking some Udacity classes at night <laughs> to yeah. tool up in something. But college is very expensive. I mean, it's four years, and it, there's the out-of-pocket, which has become quite expensive, whether it's paid for by the state or the, the, the student. Um, the opportunity cost is enormous. It, it's I mean, fascinating to me how little comp competition there is in alternatives that are just life-transforming. Yeah. So Other than college. Yeah, yeah. So that yeah. Now that raises the issue of sort of you know why does this endure as a um, um, sort of a, a ritual that that people go through? And uh, you know, we've had we've had a lot of discussions, as you know. Brian Kaplan, who blogs on EconLog, has, has suggested a that it's all about signaling. So imagine I'm going to uh, I'm thinking about hiring you, and I in, I interview you, and in the interview you come off as having a lot of cognitive ability, so I, I'm not really worried about that. Uh, but you haven't gone to college, and that makes me wonder, well, uh, maybe you're not really conscientious. Maybe the reason you didn't go to college is you really couldn't turn in papers on time. And as an employer, I need, you know, I need people to, to turn in their projects on time. Or maybe you demonstrate somehow or in the discussion that you've turned in your papers on time uh, but now I'm being, I get the impression that, well, you, you could, you could have gone to college, but you just chose to because you just want to be different. And what, what Brian would argue is that you're signaling that you, at this point, that, you know, if you're bright enough and conscientious enough to go to college, but you don't, you're signaling that you're willing to be different, that you don't, uh, you don't accept the norms of society. And so again, as an employer, I've got to worry that, uh, you know, sometimes you have to do something that doesn't make sense to you, but we do it because we do it in the organization, and you're just supposed it to do to it. Done, yeah. It needs to get done because the organization demands it, and if you won't do it, that's going to cause problems. And you may be exactly that type of person if in today's environment where the normal thing to do is to go to college, you chose not to. You, you may be this rebel that I can't that it was going to be hard for me to manage. And uh, so his argument is that you, that right now, uh, not going to college 
will, you know, sends a negative signal. It doesn't make you stupider. It's not mm. that you lost the chance to get smarter. It's that you just you, – you, you don't have this credential that you need to prove that you're, you can be a good peg to put in a hole somewhere. Yeah, that it's you, depressing that, that you, yeah, that, that you, 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 you've, you've demonstrated clearly that you are a nonconformist in a world, in, and in many organizations, you need some level of conformity. And the flip to, side, of course, is that by going and jumping through all the right hoops and getting the good grades, I've demonstrated stick to itiveness, so, uh, conformity, um, and the willing to do something just because somebody told you yeah. to do it. Yeah. What do you think of that? Um. It, I think it it raises the question of there's a lot of twenty dollar bills left on the sidewalk. That if somebody could come up with an alternative way of demonstrating that, then that's less expensive than college. Then presumably the world would be the path to their door. If I could come away, if I could come up away with certifying that you are, um, you know, bright, conscientious, and conformist, of course. The conformist challenge becomes almost, by definition, a problem. But if I could, if I can solve that, then if if Brian is right that that's the main thing, then uh, then you could vision the economy jumping very quickly to a different equilibrium where these this alternative certification method dominates, and sort of people leave college in droves. You know, because once it becomes conformist to accept the alternative certification, then you know the coll- current college has got nothing in some sense. Yeah, and and since they're so expensive, you can make an enormous amount of money yeah. charging something in between the tuition rate and zero, half of tuition, and people could be done in six months or two years. You could still have a four year thing if you wanted. It'd yeah. just be a fraction of the cost. You don't need the bricks and mortar. You don't you need something, presumably, yeah. uh, the alternative. But it suggests there's you say twenty dollar bill lying on on the ground, meaning there's some unexploited profit opportunity. Yeah. A lot of people talking about it too. So it's not a secret that this profit opportunity is allegedly out there. Yeah. And a lot of people are trying at it. And my guess is that that some some people will succeed at it. I, again, I, I go back to the technologies that I think will help. Uh, I, I think some of them are farther away than people think. It's not just a matter of slapping up a few videos and a few uh, multiple choice tests and saying, "Okay, we can we can replace college." But I think at some point, uh, people will start to pick up those uh, some of those twenty dollar bills. Let's give you my perspective. I I think. I think college is three things. It's it's a sorting mechanism. It's a credential signaling thing for sure, some of it. It is a transformational experience if you take the right classes and it's fit for you. But the third thing is it's a place and a time to explore who you are and what you're interested in and what you might want to do with your life in a fairly safe setting. Uh, And that's an incredible luxury that hasn't been available to humanity until the last half century or so. And it's a statement about how rich we are that we think it's okay to, to take four years off to yeah, dabble in a few different subjects, see what you like, try to figure out what you're what you're about, stay up late at night and argue with your new friends. You know, it's uh it's a consumption good. Yeah, the uh there's an episode of Dawson's Creek, which used to be uh my one of my daughter's favorite shows when she was in high school, and uh it, it, one of the characters says something to the effect that the uh college is the world's nicest holding pen. And uh you know the View that well, maybe it doesn't doesn't really do much for you, but it's certainly a nice nice place to hold on to these uh, these people that society doesn't quite know what to do with because they haven't grown up and they're uh, but they're not children. I can't end on that. I was gonna I was gonna <laughs> end there. It's that's too um, too, it's depressing. too depressing. Yeah, you want to say something cheerful about where education might be going down the road with these new with the innovations that will work? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the the um, the really and uh, I'm sort of channeling Tyler Cowen on this, but there there are two kind of exciting opportunities, exciting exciting trends. One is again this trend for the self learner, somebody who's able to teach themselves, uh, even if they can't get a college degree. At some point in their lives, if they develop that ability and have that ability, um, you know, they can be right already. They can become great computer programmers by asking Professor Google, and and soon they'll be able to you know learn things from their tablet computers and and 
and uh, you know, Apple wants to talk about Apple University, and Google has Google Course Builder, and there is just so there are tremendous opportunities for the self learner. And the other thing is that um, there are tremendous opportunities for people in other countries who've had no access to education. Um, all sorts of stories about, I mean, India has a horrible primary education system. People don't realize that as people, you know, see people from India in the United States and think, oh, what, what a wonderfully educated people they are. Um, you know, these Indian immigrants. Not a representative sample. Yeah. So we think, wow, they're, they're, that, that must be a great system. But in fact, it's, it's a horrible primary education system. A lot of places have, you know, little or no access to college. And, um, the the numbers of people who can take advantage of education from uh, these other countries, that's going to be uh, really exciting over the next 20 or 30 years. It's going to be, uh, as I think the last 20 years have been for the United States, a challenge for the United States in that uh, you know a layer of people will find themselves competing, you know, that being an American citizen is that the marginal value of that is no longer as high as it was before because they're going to be facing competition from Africans and Indians and Chinese that they wouldn't have faced before. Uh, but but uh, for the people in those other countries, it's going to be a tremendous opportunity. My guest today has been Arnold Kling. Arnold, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thank you, Russ. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.